Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap. I'm really excited about this one. We have lots of demos for this one. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of it, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for Rachel, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we will try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. Also happening at the end of today's webinar, we'll be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is monitoring serverless applications with Datadog. Our speaker today is Rachel, Rachel White, easy for me to say, who is a technical evangelist at Datadog. Rachel, thank you so much for joining me today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I'm going to take myself off camera, put myself on mute, and let you get right into your presentation. Great. All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Monitoring Serverless Applications with Datadog. My name is Rachel White, and I am a technical evangelist at Datadog. I'm a full stack engineer, but my specialty is Node.js and creative coding. If you have any additional questions outside of this talk after the Q&A, if you just, you know, come up with one later, feel free to reach out to me on OHO, on, at OHO on Twitter, if you have any additional questions. So today we're going to go over a few different items, including what the difference is between traditional and serverless applications is, learning about Twitter bots, coding and generative art, serverless applications, specifically using AWS Lambda, and we'll learn how to monitor the serverless application we'll be building. So let's learn what exactly is serverless. To start, we need to understand where we're at with traditional application architecture. Traditional web ap applications have what we refer to as stacks, and these stacks typically consist of an operating system, a server, a database, and a programming language. Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP is a LAMP stack. Mac OS, Apache, MySQL, and PHP is MAMP. MongoDB, Express, Angular, and Node is mean, and JavaScript APIs and markup is the Jamstack, which is a fairly new name for a more simple approach to web applications. And these are apps that have 100% uptime. You typically have configuration over your own server and have full control over what versions of whatever technologies you're working with. And we refer to these kinds of applications as monoliths usually because they're typically controlled via a single deployment. It means we have a quick minimum viable product, but it also means that it's harder for us to change a piece of our application architecture as nothing is isolated and a lot of things rely on each other. So an improvement on the traditional architecture is a microservices environment. And in that environment, everything is separate and relates to a specific feature. You can mix technologies by choosing suitable programming languages and frameworks for each service, better scalability, and each service can be scaled independently according to its traffic. Um, and each feature is deployed separately as well. So with serverless, the cloud provider you choose runs your code and you don't really have to think about configuring servers at all. You only pay for what you use, so you aren't paying the cost that you would normally incur with a server running 24 seven. And it's also easier to adapt at scale by having technologies automatically scale with demand. So today we're specifically talking about AWS Lambda for our serverless functions. Um, you can run code for virtually any type of application or backend service, all with zero administration. You just upload your code as a zip file or a container image, and Lambda automatically and precisely allocates compute execution power and runs your code based on the incoming request or event for any scale of traffic. 
You can set up your code to automatically trigger from 140 AWS services or call it directly from any web or mobile app. You can write Lambda functions in your favorite language, Node.js, Python, Go, Java, and more, and use both serverless and container tools such as AWS SAM, Docker CLI to build, test, and deploy your functions. So now that we know what we're working with, let's talk about how we can monitor these, those serverless environments. So our main problem that we're trying to solve is how are we going to debug a server that doesn't exist? How can we take traditional observability practices and adapt it to a serverless ecosystem? Modern infrastructure isn't simple at all. It's not just a server or two for our applications. There are many processes to look at. So how do you debug a server that doesn't exist in this environment? Serverless has very platform specific constraints that you have to think about. You need to think about it in terms of how much memory do we want to allocate, which we do in regular applications, but with serverless, we have to consider it for each request that comes through. You have to deal with cold starts, which happen when you execute an inactive function. The delay comes from your cloud provider provisioning your selected runtime container and then running your function. And you also have to deal with API gateways as intermediaries. So there's an API gateway or a queue, and then that calls your serverless application. And every year, Datadog has done state of serverless or a state of containers, where we dive into the data to see what kind of usage we're seeing with our customers. And we found that half of AWS users have adopted Lambda, which tells us that there's no doubt that there are use cases and business value for using serverless. Larger organizations are embracing Lambda the quickest, which is interesting because usually the stereotype is that larger companies are the last to embrace new technologies because there's too many blockers. But larger organizations are finding value in the serverless model the most. So how are we going to see that our serverless functions are working as intended? And Datadog makes it really easy. The first part is enabling the AWS integration, and the AWS integration sets up some IAM roles, and it begins scraping your AWS account for information about what's going on within your AWS infrastructure. And then we add the forwarder, which is going to ship all of the metrics for serverless back to Datadog. And finally, we instrument it with our programming language of choice. So once you've done your initial instrumentation, the first thing that you'll get out of the box is some metrics and a dashboard. The metrics and the dashboard give you a base to begin to rationalize about what is happening within your serverless application. In this case, we're looking at this dashboard and there's a couple things that stick out. Base level, how many invocations of my serverless function do I have? How many errors, how many cold starts? Having this around lets you see the base level for your systems and be aware when something fundamentally changes and when there may be something going on in your application that warrants some attention. In addition to that, let's look at some other items. Errors are obvious to check out, slowest Lambda functions, top invoked functions and top cold starting functions. Also, you're able to look at most expensive functions to see what is costing the most to execute within your AWS ecosystem. And all of these are going to give you a baseline to dig deeper into some items of what you'd want to optimize. In addition to setting up those dashboards out of the box, you might be interested in setting up some business level metrics. The whole reason we're writing software is to deliver business value. And as soon as you can get the software you're writing to quantify and track those business level metrics on a dashboard somewhere, it's critical to building a feedback loop. You really want to know, is your software delivering the value that your business expects? Or did something go wrong? Or have you introduced something that broke things? Adding metrics allows you to, for this example, know how many shopping carts have been abandoned and how long it's taking people to check out. You can also see something that's once removed from serverless, but is potentially a big part of the experience of deploying serverless applications, which is real user monitoring. Potentially, if you deploy a serverless application, you want to know what your end users are experiencing. And this is circling back to what, what is the business value that our software is delivering and what are the trends for the underlying value that we're delivering to our customers. 
Mentioning the out-of-the-box things with the serverless instrumentation, one of the things you get is this serverless infrastructure tab. It's another way to think about all of the serverless functions that we have that exist at a high level. Invocations, errors, how long things are taking, all of these point to costs, application performance, and general trends. Within each of these, we can talk about the serverless applications we have and pinpoint where there might be problems or bottlenecks in our deployment. And speaking of deployments, one of the things that is super critical in seeing when changes are introduced and how they affect things overall, uh, and with the uh, excuse me, and with the deployments tab, we're able to see all of the deployments as they happen across time. They'll show up as so we'll be able to track over time if error is potentially because of a new software or was it because of a change in user behavior, an attack or something else. It gives you another data point for what is happening inside your systems. Mentioning before, APM has language level instrumentation for serverless applications. It's one of the biggest benefits you can get out of monitoring your software. APM allows you to see your software as services instead of functioning on it as a thing that runs somewhere. You can focus on it as a service that runs somewhere and delivers a simple thing. With this screenshot, we're looking at a trace that came in through AWS Lambda, and you can see the darker green, which is the Lambda being called. Above that is the top level span, and that's an API gateway calling that Lambda. Earlier, we talked about how serverless applications only existing for a few hundred milliseconds, and it's not even directly, not even called directly, it's called by something else. Distributed traces and APM give us a way to ration about that entire unit of work and all of the things that happen within it. So we can see the original API gateway call, the sub call to our Lambda, along with the status code, request ID, and the trace ID. Below the AWS Lambda, you can see that there are logs attached to it. So you can see logs across the entire request, in, across, the entire re request across platforms. Um, it's a super powerful tool in reasoning about what may be happening within your software platform. One of the biggest strengths for Datadog is the ability to do traces, logs, and metrics across all platforms. In this case, it's another trace, another piece of APM. It's a request that originally came in through a Ruby on Rails application. And right at the orange, it calls an API gateway. And then that API gateway calls a Lambda. And then there's actually another Lambda that it's happening in the EU. And by having a single place to think about software as services and software as systems that interconnect, Datadog gives you a way to jump up and down abstraction layers. We're using multiple platforms in a single request and we're able to drop down into each one of the specific subdomains for each specific platform. It's a very powerful way to think about systems when you have these diverse platforms deployed. And then for logs, Datadog's Lambda layer automatically forwards CloudWatch logs to the forwarder which then pushes them to Datadog. And then the forwarder can send logs and other telemetry to your account, such as Amazon S3 events and Amazon Kinesis data stream events. Deploying the forwarder via CloudFormation is recommended as AWS will then automatically create the Lambda function with the appropriate role, um, and then add Datadog's Lambda layer and create relevant tags like function name, region, and account ID, which you can then use in Datadog to search through your logs. Because the forwarder is a Lambda function, it relies on triggers to execute. You can let Datadog automatically set these triggers up for you, or you can manually set them up to forward data as soon as they are added to S3 buckets or CloudWatch log groups. And once configured, Datadog's Lambda forwarder will begin sending logs from Lambda and any other AWS services you've configured to your Datadog account. Lambda functions generate a large volume of logs, making it difficult to pinpoint issues during an incident or simply to monitor the current state of your functions. You can use Datadog's log patterns to help you surface interesting trends in your logs. For example, if you notice a spike in Lambda errors in your dashboard, you can use log patterns to quickly search for the most common types of errors. We're also able to build up what we refer to as a service map. A service map is going to give us a high level overview over the overall architecture of our systems. In the top right, you can see it says the past hour, and we're able to change that so that we can see how our system architecture changes over time. 
So if we have independent teams that are deploying on their own and are spinning up their own services, this is a way to look and rationalize what is happening rather than going back to the architecture diagram that may or may not be a month or two out of date. Another thing to point out here is that some circles are red, some are green, and some are gray. Green means that all of the monitors are associated with the services are passing. Red, red means that there's at least one monitor that is failing on that system. And you can also see that there are icons for serverless functions, custom functions, et cetera. And we can see the overall architecture, including databases and cache layers in our system. Going back to the levels of abstraction with APM and going back to the service level, this is the APM service page for a serverless function, and it looks just like the APM page for any other service application, regardless of the underlying platform. And we can see on a service level how it's performing and behaving. So critical points for how you monitor this thing that doesn't exist for 99% of the time. You want to pivot between abstraction layers. You want to use APM for service and application level problems so that you can dive into APM and see whether or not the service is giving back the intended responses. Is your latency too high or is your JSON formatted correctly? Those service level questions you can answer with APM. You're going to use the serverless metrics and dashboards to see the state of your platform. How many requests are we getting? Where are they coming from? Are we taking longer, longer in our Lambda services and which ones are taking longer? Referring back to the service map for your overall architecture, one of the tricky things to do uh, when you move to a microservices application is making sure you're not running into circular dependencies where you can't deploy and upgrade to one service without bringing down another service. And having these kinds of unknown interdependencies that exist and that you're not aware of. Having the service map lets you think about these changes over time and it lets you think about getting rid of a service and whether it may or may not be safe to get rid of it so you can see if it's still used in production somewhere. The reason that we're building software is to deliver business value and getting your metrics onto a dashboard so that you can quantify how you how your deployments are improving the overall business processes are, is critical in building your story for how and why you're building software. And the last thing that only really applies if you're doing serverless for a web application is adding real user monitoring to the front end so that you can see the end user experience beyond getting the website to the end user. So how are they interacting with it, et cetera. So now that we know how to handle our serverless environments, let's talk a little bit more about um, what we're going to use to build our Lambda function and how we're going to set up our monitoring. So let's talk about all of the parts of that application before we get into the actual code. We'll be using a serverless, uh, we'll be using a serverless framework for our function. Um, it's serverless.com. It has a Node.js AWS template so that we can get started very quickly. It lets you develop infinitely scalable pay per execution serverless applications. A single configuration file allows you to list your functions and define the endpoints that they're subscribed to, if they're subscribed to any. Um, it provides structure, automation, and best practices out of the box, allowing you to focus on building sophisticated event-driven serverless architectures comprised of functions and events. And it has support for all major cloud providers, and the serverless framework CLI provides a single cross-provider developer experience. So you can write once and deploy many. For AWS services, we'll be using Lambda functions, uh, S3 bucket to store our generative images in case we would like to use them later, and a Cloudflare cron trigger for executing our function. On the Datadog side, we'll be walking through how to set up the data, uh, how to set up the Datadog AWS integration, Datadog Lambda forwarder and also integrating AWS X-Ray for distributed tracing through our function. For our actual function, we'll be creating it with Node.js. This is just a matter of personal preference. You can choose whichever language is your favorite. Um, we'll be using Canvas to create generative art that we're making based off of color palettes that we get from the Color Lovers API. 
After the images are created, we'll save them to an S3 bucket with the AWS SDK in case we want to get non-compressed versions of them later. And lastly, we'll use Twit, which is an API client for Node that allows us to interact with the Twitter API to upload media and construct a tweet. Lastly, I want to tell you a little bit about some background for Twitter bots. Um, they used to be really popular a few years ago before Twitter made it so that you had to apply for a developer account in order to have access to their API. There's usually two different kinds of bots. Um, some are generative image bots and the other are text-based, uh, either tweeting out random words mashed together or Markov chaining data from various corpora. Uh, it was a great way for people who may not be exceedingly technical to get their hands on some code and try things out, and people made a lot of tools that made it even easier for people to accomplish the art that they wanted to. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a few of my favorite bots and resources if this is something that you would like to explore more on your own. The reason that we're using Twitter bots for this example is while you would typically use serverless functions in a much larger, larger ecosystem, by building a Twitter bot as a serverless function with multiple API calls, we'll be able to get insight to have a service map and traces uh, throughout the API calls that are being made. So it's a good small use case, um, and plus it's fun, and I like to make learning fun. So the first Twitter bot I want to tell you about is called Softlin. It's an image bot made by V21 on Twitter. It uses something called Tracery, which is a tool to generate language and text. Um, but bot developers realized that they could use its structure to replace elements within SVG. So that enabled you to have a lot of flexibility when creating generative images. So I think four times a day, the bot tweets out these soft landscapes that are SVG files that have various gradients that trade in different um, colors. And it's just, it's just nice and pleasant. And the second one that I want to tell you about is a bracket meme bot, which is made by Darius Kazemi, who's a super prolific bot maker. And he thankfully documents mostly everything that he makes. Uh, bracket meme bot takes random categories of images or random categories of items from Wikipedia that meet a certain set of guidelines. So um, the categories of items must, must have a plural noun in the title uh, and it must have 16 pages at least. And then once it finds categories that meet those requirements, it picks 16 of them at random and draws them on the bracket. It's super silly um, and you end up with brackets like what is the best SpongeBob SquarePants video game and what is the best underground laboratory. Um, and I picked one from Darius specifically because he also keeps a GitHub repository of a lot of corpora that um, a ton of bot makers pull from, which I'll link you to in the next slide in case you would like to try building some bots yourself. So if you're interested in learning more about the tools used to make these, as well as more information on bot making in general, these links are a great place uh, are a great place to start. Tracery is the tool that allows you to do um, replacement of text. It's also what's used by cheap bots done quick to do generative SVG bots. Um, that GitHub repository is Darius's corpora where you can find lists of things like animals, tarot cards, planets, everything. And they're, I think they're structured um, as, as objects that way you can iterate over them as you would like. And then botwiki.org is a resource for bot makers who are uh, wanting to learn more. There's also a bunch of lists of bots and it's just a really cool site in general. So I highly recommend uh, checking that out. All right, so now that we know the tools that we're using, let's get into the setup and check out some code. Bear with me here as I switch over to my other information. Okay, let's see. Okay, cool. So um, the first thing that we are going to do is install the serverless framework. 
um, which is going to make it easier for us to deploy our application. Um, their Getting Started page has instructions for installing the CLI tool, no matter what operating system you're on. Um, for our sake, we are going to install via NPM. I have, I have to sudo, it's a work machine, don't judge me. However, I have already installed it just for the sake of going through the motions. Cool. So we're installing the serverless uh, framework on our machine. And the next thing that we are going to do is now that we have the um, serverless framework installed, we need to set up our AWS credentials with that framework. But first, we need to create those credentials. So the way that we um, get those is by logging into our AWS console and then clicking on your name and clicking into my security credentials. And then inside your security credentials, you should be able to create a new access key and uh, you'll have a pop-up and it'll give you an access key and token. Um, and you'll be able to run authentication commands from that. So now we're ready to set up our credentials. You can just uh, set up the exports in your command line so that, that you're ready to um, use the serverless framework to deploy right from there. So let me get my iTerm back. I lost the window. Okay. So let's pretend that I already typed in these export commands. Um, now that we have gotten our credentials, what we're going to do is we are going to provision a new folder to um, have a base for our template. So let's do um, serverless demo. Make this text a little bigger as well. All right, so now that we're in the serverless demo folder, we are going to type serverless create template AWS node.js. And what this is going to do is it's going to use the serverless framework to generate a boilerplate for um, AWS serverless bot with a node.js um, default. And let's grab VS Code now. Let's open that folder. So I can show you what it has created for us. It's only created a few files. Um, let me make this full screen. So it creates a serverless YAML file, which um, you know is just instructions for um, AWS of what it's going to do. You don't really need to change anything in here out of the box. Um, everything is commented, so it explains um, line by line uh, if you need to get more specific into the uh, like what function you're creating, you can go through that. I'm not going to read through it line by line just for the sake of time, but um, you can see here it's, we're creating a function, handler hello, and then we go over to the handler and it's module exports.hello. And it's just returning a status code and a body of go serverless v1, your function executed successfully. So let's make that smaller again, go back to iTerm. And let's deploy this to our um, Lambda so that we can see what it looks like when it is uploaded to AWS. It takes a little bit. Um, what it does is, like I said earlier, with Lambda, you just have to upload a zip. Um, and so it's taking the uh, template that it has generated for you, it's zipping it, and it is sending it on over to AWS. It's probably going to take eh, 30 seconds or so. Um, I'm going to actually close this because we don't need it anymore as we are waiting for it to upload. Finished uploading. There we go. Sorry, I'm trying to see past my giant microphone onto my other monitor. And so um, you can see I typed SLS deploy. That's just short for serverless deploy. 
And now if we go back to our AWS management console, I'm already on the Lambda function uh, page for all of the Lambdas that I currently have. Um, as soon as it is done updating, I will be able to show you it. Um, I would also like to say that if people are building APIs, um, that would, like there's multiple use cases for functions. Obviously today, we're just creating a Lambda function that is going to get executed and do a thing, but you can create a Lambda function that acts as like an API that returns stuff instead of just doing stuff, if that makes sense. Okay, cool, it's done. So let's refresh. Now we have this serverless demo dev hello. I can click on it. I can scroll down here and it'll show you the code. Um, if you have too many lines of code, it doesn't show here, but for the sake of the demo, it will set up a little test that has not really anything in it. So you can see what it looks like. Um, now that I created a test, what I can do is run that test and it'll execute the function and it'll show me that it returns the serverless information there. So, um, like I said, if people are building APIs, the results of those queries would be returned as well. Um, we're going to be building a small application that makes multiple API calls, so it won't be necessary to return the status code since our function will just be performing an action. Some other uses for serverless functions are processing images and videos, um, APIs for interacting with the database, database events, processing SMS images, chatbots, IoT sensor input, and more. All right, so um, here's also some of the other templates that you can use um, in your templating system. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna show you the creative coding parts of the bot. Um, we'll be dealing with uh, the Canvas API, which provides uh, means for drawing graphics via JavaScript and the HTML5 Canvas element. Among other things, it can be used for animation, game graphics, data visualization, photo manipulation, and real-time video processing. There are a lot of options that you can work with that use Canvas um, from 2D to 3D, and so I'm gonna show you some of those now. And first up is which I forgot to bring up. Here we go. We'll drag you to the beginning. So P5 is a JS client-side library for creating graphic and interactive experiences. It's based on the core principles of processing and processing, if you're unfamiliar, is a flexible software sketchbook and a language for learning how to code within the context of visual arts. So let's look at a couple of examples of that. Um, this is cyber flowers, which are generative art flowers. If I hit refresh, you can see it is actively drawing it in the browser, which is really cool. Another example is um, mouse text, which is an interactive poem. So every time I click on this, we're getting another line of the poem and um, an interactive bit of what P5 can do. And last is Fractal Zone, which is just a gallery of fractals that are generated with P5, which is really cool. Um, and then the next thing I'm gonna tell you about is 3JS, which is a lightweight 3D library with a default WebGL renderer. So this library also provides Canvas 2D, um, SVG and CSS 3D renderers in the examples. It's super powerful and it also allows you to create extremely interactable web experiences. So these are mainly used for like really cool 3D things. Um, this is the first one that I'm gonna show you, which is this website that is just wild. You can see the, the 3D in the background as you scroll through. The next one I'm gonna show you is this Aquarium RU site, which has also some intense 3D going on that my browser kind of gets a little stuck on as I'm scrolling through. Um, so for our use case, we're just dealing with 2D for our Canvas exercise and a great tool to use to experiment with base Canvas capabilities is Canvas Sketch, which is um, github.com 
Matt D E S L canvas dot sketch. Um, I took a course taught by the creator online and I used a base for what I was taught there to create my generative bot that we are using today. So this is the resource for that. I highly recommend this if it's something you're interested in and it makes it really easy. Okay, so for our Twitter bot, um, we're using Twit which is the Twitter API client for Node. It simplifies a lot of the process for creating these Twitter bots. Um, you can also find out more information about the Twitter API and request a developer account, which takes about a week to get approved. And that's developer.twitter.com. And we will also be using the Color Lovers API, which, um, we're using it, it, you don't need to sign up for it. It's totally free. Um, you don't need to use a token or anything. And what we're using it for is we're getting user generated color palettes and we're using that color palette to uh, create our bot. All right, so I have uploaded base code for the Twitter bot to my repository, which is github.com slash Rachel Nicole slash color glimpse. And I have that open. Let me navigate to that. Okay, good. Git branch. What is it that puts git branch? Git branch all. Okay, that's what I thought. Git checkout. I spelled that wrong. There we go. All right, so um, let's take a look at this code. All right, so um, let's focus on the actual whole Twitter bot in the handler.js and I'll walk you through code for code or line for line in this. So we are using Axios for our HTTP requests, Canvas for our image generation, setting up our base Canvas size and setting the context to 2D. FS is for file system, the path module provides utilities for working with system paths and Twit is our Twitter API client. Um, first up, we're defining our AWS access key in secret, which I showed you how to get earlier. Then we're setting up new instance of Twit and supplying credentials that you get from the Twitter developer dashboard. Uh, then we're setting up S3, and we're using the same access key and ID as before. We define our function so that we'll be able to um, upload images and save them to the S3 bucket. Then we set up a promise that returns data we get from hitting the color lovers random color palettes API. And then inside our module exports, we call the color group function, scope out the data to an object with its own key value pairs so that it's easier to work with. And now that we have our palette information, let's get into the actual canvas function. We're setting up some variables to define width and height as 1280 and a utility function that gives us a random number between whatever min and max we provide. We're gonna create a hundred line items and then an array of that many items where we randomly generate the start and end position of that line. And for the background of our canvas, we are going to pop off the last color in our palette, only use it for that. CTX is canvas get context that we shortened when we required it up top. Um, and first we fill the entire square with the background color that we saved before. And then we draw each line item in our line array, assigning each one a different color and a different stroke width. And once that is done, we take the canvas and we convert it to a data URI and name it using a JavaScript date object that we've replaced slashes with dashes with, because otherwise it would create folders when we upload it to our S3 bucket and it would be really messy. Um, then we set up the parameters of our image, uh, including what bucket it's going to, what the file name is, and upload it to S3 returns a success or error. And we don't need to upload it directly to Twitter from our S3 bucket. We just wanna save it in case uh, someone might want a better resolution copy of it later. 
And then after that, we use Twit to upload our image information, including the alt text. Uh, and we generate the text of the post based off of the palette name, author, and URL to the full palette. And it posts it to our account and it returns a success or error. So now that we have our code, uh, what we wanna do next is add the instrumentation so that we're able to, um, you know, use Datadog and see all those cool things that you can do with AWS integration. So you can see the top has changed now um, and we're gonna set it up for monitoring with Datadog. So I should probably show you what the bot looks like. So now you can go to twitter.com color glimpse and see our Twitter bot that tweets out randomly generated art with the color palettes that we have cho chosen. All right, so um, first thing that we're gonna do is um, when you click on the AWS integrations, you are going to supply your account ID. So give me one sec. Oops. And you can see it gives you just some YAML to copy and paste into your serverless.yaml right here, which goes down at the bottom. Uh, you would put in your API key here, which you would find in your Datadog dashboard under um, integrations APIs. And also make sure you have the serverless plugin Datadog added there. And so the next thing that we're going to do is add the forwarder. And the way that we add the forwarder is, um, where is the serverless forwarder? I am losing my tabs. That's what happens when you open up like 50 at once. The forwarder has a launch stack directly from the documentation page. So you're able to click on that and it'll open up your Datadog dashboard. And I've already done it, so it has my information in there, but you can paste your Datadog API key and run um, down here, create stack, and it'll create all of those IIM roles for you. Um, and then don't forget to get back into your dashboard. Let's do that one more time, that opens it up early. Log in. I'm already logged in, so it'll automatically go there. Um, and then I forgot to mention the first thing that we need to do, which is go into integrations and set up the integration for AWS, which is just one click and you provide in that custom token and just set it up and it sets everything up for you. So the only other thing that we need to do now, um, it'll be automatically be collecting all of our uh, AWS info that we are doing in the AWS ecosystem is we need to do a little bit of presentation for our code to get tracing. And that is with AWS X-Ray. Um, the documentation says you need to make sure that these are in your policy document. They're generated automatically, I believe, so you don't always necessarily uh, need to add that, but it's worth noting. Uh, and then you need to install the X-Ray library uh, through the command line, which is npm install AWS X-Ray SDK. And now that we have that installed, um, we're ready to do the rest. And so we need to add in the code for capturing all traces, which is HTTP and HTTPS, and um, as well as capturing chained promises, which is the capture promise because it's super important. We're using Node. Um, we're also going to need to change the Axios name to Axios with X-Ray just to remember what it is that we're doing. Um, and that is all that we need to do for our specific use case. The only other thing that we need to take a look at is get back into our AWS console. And I can show you where the cron job is. So if we go into our Lambda now,
and click on our function, you can see this bit that is called um, trigger. And when you click add trigger, you can click on these items and see that you can set up the interval for um, a specific amount of time. And so right now I have it running um, every 12 hours, I believe, and you can set it up to be whatever you would like. Cool. All right, so now that we have all of that stuff set up, we're ready to actually look at our dashboard and see uh, what kind of information we can find. So now that we have everything instrumented, um, we are ready to see what our Lambda functions look, at, look like. So we're gonna start here with our service map. Um, we can see our Lambda function and all of the ongoing requests it makes to the S3 bucket, the Color Lovers API, um, and the Twitter API. There's an upload and a post, both of those. Um, and then we can click on our function and explore related logs. And I'm gonna change it to the past month since, you know, it only tweets it once every 12 hours. And in our logs, we can see all of the logs collected, broken down by error, info, or warning, which is really great. Um, there's so many. You can set up actual rules to catch only specific ones. If you want to look at, you know, only errors, you can look at that. And then let's go back to our service map and let's take a look at our service overview. And again, change it to the past month. And our service overview shows us request counts, latency information, and a breakdown of what compute time is spent doing on our function. And then lastly, let's take a look at our serverless functions. So we can get into our uh, color glimpse function and we can also see our traces which is great because we can dig into each individual request so let's take a look at this last one and we can see that flame graph that i told you about earlier of our api calls so i can see the general attempt with the lambda function that makes the call to the color lovers api the s3 bucket and then uploads and posts the image to twitter and then down here at the bottom let me drag this up so it's easier to see you can see um, all of our tags our metrics and logs for that um, each specific request so like i said this is obviously a very small example but i'm still able to get all of this information from using our aws integration and a few lines of code so now i can go in and if this was a larger system i would be able to pinpoint problem areas and be able to close the feedback loop with teams when i see areas for improvement and that's uh that's what i got for you so now it's q a time all right great so sorry about that my my little mute button didn't want to come off yeah oh, am I'm i muted, muted still really yeah i have the, <laughs> the <audio. laughs> i couldn't tell you yeah, it took forever for the mute button to go to uh turn off so yes uh it is time for question and answer period if you have a question for rachel go ahead and use your go to webinar control panel we've gotten some questions in so far so why don't we go ahead and dive right on into what we've got uh let's see first question does datadog have a package for integration with aws cdk specifically for typescript oh typescript um I am not sure off the top of my head, but if you go to our integrations pages, you should be able to see a list of everything. Um, I know that with, with Node, you're able to do it, um, but uh, I was just told that it is under development right now, so yes. Awesome, all right, great. I uh, love those real-time answers. Okay, next question. I, and I think you did actually answer this one uh, in your presentation, but does uh, is the Datadog Lambda layer open source? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, great. All right, uh, next question. What are the benefits of using Lambda uh, Datadog and not using uh, just uh, directly the Datadog software? 
Well, the benefit to using the Lambda is that you're getting things that are specific to that actual integration. So if I'm using the traces for my specific Lambda function, you might need to do some additional instrumentation that you wouldn't get out of the box because of the way that it works. So if you're using, let's say, uh, an environment where you're not able to install the Datadog agent. So if you have just like a purely serverless environment, um, you're not going to be able to install our agent yet. So that's where the, the Lambda library comes in and is really helpful because you, what, where if you were using the agent, you would get traces out of the box um, with the Lambda X-ray, you're able to get the traces without having to have all of that other configuration. All right, great. All right. So uh, still plenty of time for questions, guys. If you have one, go ahead and send it on in. We have time for maybe, I don't know, three or four more. So uh, we'll just keep plugging along here. What is the recommended way to integrate Datadog if we are using SAM, SAM, instead of serverless frameworks? Hmm. Um. Give me one second. Um, so we have a cloud formation macro that'll make it uh, able to do that. And I can paste a link to that in the chat right now. Excellent, excellent. All right, while you're at it, uh, somebody's asking if you can send out the GitHub links as well. So I wonder if you can go ahead and do that in chat. And sure. um, sorry, uh, can they clarify? Is that all of the links that I've shared the uh, the Datadog stuff as well as the the bot library and the other stuff, or just everything that I talked about, if possible? <laughs> yes, Ian, if you can go ahead and uh, put in the uh, in the question tab what links specifically you're looking for, everything or specific ones, let us know. And uh, as soon as we get that information, uh, Rachel can go ahead and, and uh, chat those out. Um, okay, so while we're waiting for that, uh, uh, here's another question for you. How is this different and better than what I can do with open tracing and open telemetry? I also don't know the answer to this off the top of my head. Um, so uh, let me see, Datadog Lambda libraries and the forwarder are for getting info into Datadog quickly and easily where open tracing and open telemetry, open telemetry are more roll your own solution. Okay. All right, let's see, uh, looks like, Yasin is okay with the links that you sent out. So hooray for that. Um, all right, guys, we have a couple more minutes left. If you have a question for Rachel, go ahead and send it on in. Uh, here's a question for you, if I can find it here. Uh, let's see, does serverless make sense for smaller sized businesses? Why and, and why or why not? Yeah, um, serverless totally makes sense for smaller businesses. Um, if, if for any reason, uh, just cost, because if you aren't using serverless for your, you know, services, you're paying for 24/7 uptime essentially. Where um, serverless is pay per compute, so you're only paying for what you use. So it's a really good option for um, small businesses uh, who are just, you know, maybe trying a certain service out. Like it, it makes total sense. All right, great. Well, that is all the questions that we have right now. I am going to uh, keep the question tab open to see if we get any stragglers in. Uh, but while we are waiting, I do want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded. So uh, if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, because I love the awesome demos, uh, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Uh, following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website. So you can always go look for it there. Just go to devops.com slash webinars, look in the on demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't look like we're getting any more questions in, so I'm going to go ahead and close out the question and answer period. I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. Uh, there are lot, lots of really great ones, so thanks so much for that. Um, okay, I did mention at the top of the hour we'd be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards, so without further ado, let's go ahead and do that.
our first winner today is Johnny W. Congratulations, Johnny. Our second webin win winner, web web easy for me to say, winner today is uh, Shireen W. Congratulations, Shireen. Third winner today is Monica R. Congratulations, Monica. And our final winner today is Mike C. Congratulations, Mike. We'll be following up with all four of you uh, via email to get your what your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. If you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. Uh, Rachel, thanks for a great presentation. Loved it. Thanks good so good much. stuff all the way around. And uh, uh, again, um, uh, thanks for sending out those those links uh, to folks. Looks like uh, we we got the the right links. So so thanks for doing that as well. Um, and uh, again, if you uh, do have any questions, uh, straggling questions for Rachel or for Datadog, uh, how can how can folks just uh, get in touch with Datadog? If uh, do you get do you guys want to do Slack channel or how do you guys uh, normally take the questions? Uh, yeah, we actually have a public Slack. Um, it's datadoghq.slack.com. That wait, yep, nope, that was the public one. That is the correct one, yeah. Where you're able to ask questions that are specific to various integrations. So there's channels for if you wanna talk about RUM and synthetics, there's channels if you wanna talk about serverless. Um, you can also tweet at me, uh, you can tweet at Datadog and we will have somebody answer you. All right, perfect, perfect. Well, such a, thanks Thanks again for a great uh, webinar. Lots of good information there. I also wanna thank the audience for joining me today. Um, for now, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody. Please stay safe.